Good evening, and welcome to Full Moon Matinee. I'm your host, The Detective, bringing you the finest crime dramas and film noir from the golden age of Hollywood. Tonight's picture is from 1948. He Walked by Night, starring Richard Basehart, James Cardwell, Scott Brady, and Jack Webb. Its storyline is very simple. It's about a small-time crook who shoots and kills a cop on his beat. And from there, the Los Angeles Police Department gets its feathers ruffled and the manhunt is on. Now, Richard Basehart, who, who's playing the lead role here, he's the crook, Roy Martin, he did a number of crime and noir films from the 40s through the 50s. Uh, films like Repeat Performance, Tension, Outside the Wall, just to name a few. Now, in television, uh, he appeared in numerous episodes uh, of various TV series from the late 50s to the early 80s. And uh, probably his most notable work there was he was the voiceover narrator in the opening credits of the 80s TV series, Knight Rider. And in that, uh, you know, of course he did the voiceover in the opening, but he did appear in its pilot episode, uh, and in that he played the role of Wilton Knight. And something else with Richard Basar here, I always like to point this out when I find things with other Ohio natives, Richard Basehart was born in Zanesville, Ohio, just about maybe an hour and a half east of Dublin here. So, from 1948, he walked by night. Let's roll the picture. This is Los Angeles, Our Lady the Queen of the Angels, as the Spaniards named her, the fastest growing city in the nation. It's been called a bunch of suburbs in search of a city, and it's been called the glamour capital of the world. A mecca for tourists, a stopover for transients, a target for gangsters, a haven for those fleeing from winter, a home for the hardworking. It is a city holding the hopes and dreams of over two million people. It sprawls out horizontally over 452 square miles of valleys and upland, of foothills and beaches. Because of that vast area, and because of a population made up of people from every state in the Union, Los Angeles is the largest police beat in the country, and one of the toughest. We're going to take you into the city hall where police headquarters are located. Here in communications are the ears and voice of the police. The lights on the complaint board flash 24 hours a day. Citizens reporting a prowler, a lost child, a man molesting a woman, an auto accident, a wild party. Spend an hour or two here and you will think the whole city has gone berserk. Minute by minute, the orders go out to the radio cars in the far-flung divisions. Watts and Wilshire and West Los Angeles. Hollywood and Hollenbeck Heights in North Hollywood. The work of the police, like that of woman, 
is never done. This is the case history of a killer, taken from the files of the detective division. The facts are told here as they happen. The story properly starts here in Hollywood Division headquarters at one o'clock of a June morning last year. Officer Robert Rawlins had finished his tour of duty and signed out. It had been a tough day. He'd be glad to get home. His wife would be waiting up for him as she always did. Hey, fella. Come here. What were you doing back at that radio shop? Miss Logan. I was on my way home. Live around here? Yeah, a couple blocks down. Let me see some identification. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I guess I forgot my wallet. Look, lad. I've got to see some identification. How about my army discharge? I got it right here. <laughs> I want to report the shooting of a policeman. Hold on, please. Give me that again, please. I'm calling to report the shooting of a policeman. What's the address? 5057 State Street, just west of Santa Monica. Just a minute. Receiving hospital, operator 2. Oh, operator 27, 5057 State Street, 5057 State Street. An officer has been shot. Send an ambulance. All units, all units in the vicinity of State Street, Santa Monica Boulevard. Proceed at once to 5057 State Street, 5057 State Street. An officer shot, code three. K to control one. Control one to 80K, go ahead. This is Breen. Instruct homicide to throw out a dragnet and pick up all suspicious characters in the area of the shooting. Also notify Sergeants Marty Brennan and Chuck Jones to report to me at the scene of the crime. Control one to 80K, Roger. Well, what have you got so far? 
Well, not much, Captain Breen. A couple of cartridge cases. Oh, Marty, Chuck. Hi, Captain. Eyewitnesses? Who was first on the scene reported it? I was. Uh, I live here. Uh, I'm a light sleeper, but my hearing is good. And my Did the officer say anything before he collapsed? Yeah, he gave oh, a description of the fella. On he the was... shooting of the officer. Suspect is a white male American. Age 26 or 7. 5 feet 10 or 11. 155 to 165 pounds. Brown hair. Regular features. Pencil mustache. Repeat broadcast. All you... Is that about it? Yes, sir, exactly. And the officer kept saying, he looked like such a nice kid. He looked like such a nice kid, as if he couldn't believe what had happened to him. I see. Is that all? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, anything else I can do, I'd be glad to help you. We may call you. Get his name and address, will you, Bob? This door been checked, Lee? Yeah, it's okay, Captain. Find anything? Nothing but some smudges so far. Found this in the glove compartment. I think it's nitroglycerin. Doesn't look quite right. Well, check it down at the lab. Right. Huh. Open this up, Joe. No key, Captain. I'll try it open. Give me that bar, Frank. Arsenal. Yeah, get a load of that. What is it? I don't know. It looks like some kind of an electrical device. United States Navy. It's either stolen a war surplus. Send all the stuff down to the lab and check the serial number on that Navy equipment. Yes, sir. Captain Breen. We found these in the weeds over by the radio store. Mm. What do you got? A pair of cloth gloves, Captain. Well, he thought of everything, didn't he? All right, give them to one of the technicians. Yes, sir. Marty, you and Chuck come along with me. Let's go downtown and see what they picked up in the dragnet. Right. We should let Chuck and me handle this case. All right. I don't want any dead heroes. I just want the man who shot Rollins. The suspects began to arrive at headquarters in droves. The police tossed every motel and hotel and many private homes in a four square mile area around the scene of the shooting. Every available radio car and patrolman and detective was out on the dragnet. The strings were being drawn tighter and tighter. Many a man returning from a date or a late party or a poker game surprisingly found himself in a squad car, its siren screaming as it brought him to the detective bureau. The dragnet gathered in some strange fish and many ordinary ones. All the rest of that night, the detectives probed, needled, questioned, quizzed. Everything was checked. Fingerprints, names, addresses, stories. Every fish in the net was examined. Most of them thrown back into the sea, not worth keeping. Except a few parole violators and slightly shady characters whose stories needed a lot of verifying. I wasn't prowling no cards. Just taking a walk, you know, getting in condition. You were running when the radio car picked you up. Yeah, maybe that's why the guys call me punchy. He's got a point there. Two felony convictions, no warrant, no warrant. He's on parole. Book him, violation of parole. Let's have the next one, Joe. What were you doing in that vacant lot? The vacant lot. Lot? What were you doing in it at that time of night? Nemo man nga kum to lo ngoi ngai si hu noi lo ngoi si si ai si sam tap cái nền bia luk dưới lại của ngô ngoi si sinh chan nghe ngoi chan ca thì giờ ngoi tu lo đầu ra sang yên. You say your name is Ralph Henderson. So what? Well, you know it's a funny thing, Ralph. There's a guy around this town that's been wearing your fingerprints. Only his name is Pete Hannon. 
Okay. So I'm dead. So what's one more confession in my life? Now you're talking to him. Okay, Andy. Hello, Harry. What have we got here? Oh, some robbery suspects. Candidates for San Quentin. Handsome here is the big shot. He runs the outfit. Have a gander at his record. Car theft, escape from reform school, robbery, assault with a deadly weapon. Not bad. Look at the heater we found on him. German Luger, fully loaded. Redhead here tried to carve up one of the arresting officers with this pretty toy. Nice boys. By dawn, many minor wrongdoings had been uncovered, and a few incipient felonies. The checking of the suspects had been thorough, painstaking, and tedious. But all the work was for nothing. The man who had shot Officer Rollins was not among them. He remained no more than a description, a shadow of a man, mysterious, elusive, deadly, hidden away somewhere in the vast city. As for Rollins himself, he couldn't help. He was in a coma at receiving hospital. Mrs. Rollins waited out the long tense hours while her husband fought to live. Many another officer's wife had so waited, many another will. The word came shortly after sunup. A white male American, 26 or 7, 5 feet 10 or 11, 155 to 165 pounds, brown hair, regular features, pencil mustache. This was no frightened fugitive. What went on in his mind? Why had he set his hand against his fellow men, taken the life of another, of a stranger, of a man who was merely doing his duty? He must have some plan, some goal that called for sudden death to anyone who got in his way. Drink it, I hope. I'm really a nice guy. Stick around. I'll prove it. Come over here. Hold this for me, will you, Chuck? Glycerin. I didn't ask for a collection of fingers, just fingerprints. All those nice fingerprints on the car belong to the man it was stolen from, Cap. Nothing on the guns or pick locks? Not even an interesting smudge. The gloves. Common type, worn by undertakers. I'll check on them. They won't show anything. What did your scientific test show? A couple of little things. Tool identification on these pick locks. I got one under the scope. You want to take a look? Yeah. Take a look. Uh, I see. Well, that's 
seems to tie the tool up with the lock. Now, if that microscope could only tell us who did it. I'm working on that. No, only an amateur would carry that liquid dynamite in a car. This boy's no amateur. Took the precaution of desensitizing it, so it'll take normal shock. Took a lot of other precautions, too. No fingerprints, no identification, nothing definite. Except he's scientific. Knows electricity. Is inventive. Yeah. I'm happy on the trigger. This is Captain Breen. Get me Captain Stevens a burglary, will you? I hate to disappoint you, Lee, but I think you've come up with something. Uh, hello, Steve. How are you? Did your daughter's marriage come off all right? Good. Look, Steve, on those burglaries of electrical equipment lately, were there any where pick locks were used to gain entry? Good. Well, let me know if there's another report of one, will you? I've got an idea the Rawlins killer may be tied in with those. Fine. Uh, and uh, give my regards to the newlyweds, too. So long, Steve. Well, what are you waiting for? You've got a job, haven't you? Get going. Yeah, let's go, Junior. Hold this for me, will you, Lee? Thanks. And so, with no fingerprints and only a vague description to go by, Sergeant Brennan turned to the modus operandi file. A criminal, like any human being, has his own habit patterns, unconscious traits that can lead to his downfall. Well, they are, Junior. A list of burglars who use pick locks for entry. Oh, great. This narrows it down to just a couple of hundred suspects in this area. Give me a match, will you? That may not be so bad. This guy's improved on the system. Maybe he's left his trademark on some other job. Well, here we go, legging it all over town, asking a million questions. What you paid for, isn't it? Am I paid to associate with you too, Junior? We could do worse. Not this year. Come on. Car 12, car 1-2, in the 10,000 block on Mississippi, a 394-15 disturbance. Car 80-K, code 1. All units, on the broadcast of the suspect arrested in the shooting of Patrolman Rollins, cancel the cancellation. Suspect released from custody. Oh, hello, Mr. Martin. you find Mr. Reeves in the machine shop. you drop in. I wanted to thank you for showing us how to handle that repair job. Help us a lot. Well, what have we got this time? Silvergrass. Well, there are plenty of these around, Roy. Not like this one. Yes, I see. I suppose, as usual, you've added your own improvements. You know, it seems wrong that a man of your talents should bother consigning equipment for rental. 
I'd like to see you devote yourself entirely to experimental electronics. It'll come one day. I'll have a place like this. Well, why wait? I've got a pretty good setup here. I'd have modern equipment to work with, a lab, and my confidence. Thanks, Mr. Reeves. I have other plans. But, Roy, you can't tell where it'll lead. Might even work your way around to a percentage of the business. I like it this way. You just run out my equipment. All right, Roy. All right. But if you should change your mind. I'm not likely to change my mind. I suppose you want me to set this up for rental, too. Mr. Reeves, you've already got five pieces of my equipment. And you'd like to know what results I've had from the rental so far, hmm? Well, I can't say as I blame you. I think you'll find this satisfactory. Satisfactory. Goodbye, Mr. Reeves. And you'll come back again soon, won't you? Sure. Oh, incidentally, how's that television projector coming along? The one you said would reflect a 12-foot image. Still working on it. I just wanted you to know I've already set up a rental on it. In fact, I think they'd like to buy. It'll come pretty high. Oh, money's no consideration with this customer. Tell him he can pick it up tomorrow. I thought you said it wasn't finished yet. It'll be finished. It uses an image fixer and then projects by ordinary incandescence. Roy, this is the best television projector I've ever seen. Let's hope that your customer thinks so. <laughs> he will. Yeah? Send him right in, Charlotte. There, you see, our customer is here, begging for the privilege of buying. Better be running along. I'm not much good at business. Oh, but Roy, he'll want to congratulate you. Just see that the price is right. <laughs> All right, Roy. I'll get you a good deal. So long. See ya. Well, Mr. Dunning, come in. Isn't it a beauty? It's a beauty, all right. You like it? I certainly do like it. You see, it's mine. What do you mean? Let me have the police. I built it. Spent years on it. Oh, you must be crazy. Roy built this machine himself. Your friends are crook, Paul. You've been taken in. Hello. Give me the burglary detail. Dear Jim, regarding your inquiry on a 38 caliber Smith and Wesson revolver, sir. Oh, come in, boys. Burglary detail just sent this report through. It's a man named Dunning reports tracing a stolen television projector to the Reeves Electronics Lab. Think it's a tie with the Rawlins case? Well, take a look at this fellow, Reeves, and see what gives. I'll notify burglary we're following up on it. Right. Come on, Junior. What else did he place with you for rental? Oh, a number of things. Uh, all war surplus that he bought on his veteran's rating. Oh, is this more of his equipment? Yes. Yes, he left it here on consignment. I'm sure that Roy can explain everything. Well, maybe he can, Mr. Reeves, if you'll tell us where he lives. But I don't know. Mr. Martin's on the phone, sir. I'd better talk to him. I think so, Mr. Reeves. I'll take it in the superintendent's office. Tell him that you sold the set, and his money's waiting for him here. Find out what time he's coming by. Put Mr. Martin on. Hello, Roy. Yes, yes, I've sold it. Your money is waiting here for you. Yes, I'll be working late tonight. What time will you be by? First thing in the morning. Well, maybe you better come in tonight, Roy. A couple of things I want cleared up. Like what? Oh, technical things. 
Besides, I don't like to leave the money in the plant overnight. How about 8.30? Fine, fine. I'll see you then. I'll leave the front door unlocked. You'll be here at 8.30. Well, I'll just run along home and get some dinner. Uh, we'd like you to stay, too, Mr. Reeves. Why? For company. You want to cooperate, don't you, Mr. Reeves? Certainly. Good. Now, you just wait in your office. We'll be around. Very well. This way, gentlemen. That you, Roy? Go outside and block that alley door. Where are you, Roy? Who's in here? No one. I'm alone. Come on in. I've got your money for it. Bring it out here. All right. Just a minute.
even looks like Roy Martin. He had such a fine face. Didn't keep him from carrying a gun. Or didn't you know that? No, I didn't. I told you all I know, all he ever told me. What about his friends? Didn't he have a girl? No, no, I don't think so. He had no interest in anything but electronics. Where did he pick up the subject? Books. Magazines? Mostly from the Signal Corps. He was attached to a radar unit. Get a teletype off to the War Department. That might help. Yes? Ready on your call to receiving hospital, Captain Breen. Hello, uh, this is Captain Breen. What is the latest report on Sergeant Jones? I see. Well... Let me know if there's any change, will you? Thanks. Chuck's in pretty bad shape, Marty. He's paralyzed. May never walk again. Oh, I'm sorry. It's funny that Martin showed up at 7 when he told you he wouldn't be there until 8.30. I don't know why. Except he was always unpredictable. I'll tell you why. Because you warned him. That's why he came early. That's why he came in the back way. But you heard me tell him the front door would be open. And the key didn't let him in the back way? He must have had one made. Why don't you tell us the truth? Marty. Now look, Paul. You can make it a lot easier for us to believe your story if you'll just give us some facts. Something that might help us. I told you all I know. I've been gullible, all right, letting him make a fool of me. But I'd do anything to make up for what he did to Detective Jones. Sure. Sure you would. You can go now. Oh, thanks. Thanks. My friend, thank you. Ouch, my character. That's good. We'll call you if we need you. Thank you very much. I think he's telling the truth, Marty. I think he's just gullible, like he said. What about the stolen stuff he was trying to peddle for Martin? We'll use it for bait. Maybe Martin will come back for it. Then we can ask him. Here. Nevertheless, I want a 24-hour tail put on Reeves, and I want to watch on his home in his factory. Right. You can keep those. <laughs> okay, Captain. And now the killer changed his tactics, his modus operandi. It would baffle the police. They always expected burglars to remain burglars, not go in for stick-ups. They'd never tie this up with him. So wearing a variety of disguises, coming and going like a shadow, ready to kill if cornered, he struck the bottle stores in a one-man blitz that had the robbery detail dizzy. Killer, always resourceful, always thinking along lines that would baffle his hunters, had discovered an ideal avenue of escape. Under Los Angeles is a vast and intricate system of huge storm drains built to siphon off the flash floods of the rainy season. Many of the tunnels are large enough for two cars to drive abreast. Here were 700 miles of hidden highways, ideal for the use of someone who needed to hurry from place to place without being seen. Ideal as a hiding place for guns and supplies in case of emergency. What is it, Lee? Well, the reason I ask you to come over is I think I've hit on something. An identification? No, not quite, but a tie-up. Now, 
These are the shells from the gun that killed Rawlins. These were fired in the liquor store holdup in which the bandit got away. And these were fired at Chuck. Now, as you know, every ejector, even in guns of the same model and caliber, is different. Each one leaves its own markings on the cartridge casing. Now, look at these fine striations. This deep gouge. The same on all three. Hmm. In other words, the man who killed Rawlins and the man who shot at Jones and Brennan, the stick-up was blitzing the liquor stores, are all the same man. Right. All we need to know is what that man looks like. Get me Chandler and robbery, will you? I've got an idea about that. Also, it'll give us a chance to see if Reeves is on the level with us. Uh, Steve. Breen. About those blitz holdups you're on. Round up all the victims and have them down here tonight, will you? Oh, it's just a little scheme. Thanks, Steve. Hmm, that's good. Now sketch another one of the same type, only this time thin it out a little, huh? All right. Hi, Lee. How's it coming? Be ready for tonight? We'll be ready. Think it'll work? It should. Where'd you get the idea? From a kidnapping case in Chicago. But I thought these slides might be an improvement over the method they used. Could be. Captain thinks so. Hello again. Well, it seems like the cops are rounding up the usual suspects. <laughs> That's how they said it in Casablanca. But uh, none of them seem to be panning out. Y you know, they've all got alibis. And I gotta say this, how'd you like that scene where they're standing by that old school computer and it's spitting out the punch cards? <laughs> I'll tell you, how old, you about have to be my age or older if you can remember back when computers used to use punch cards. I'll tell you, there was a blast from the past. Now, the voiceover narration in tonight's picture is being done by Reed Hadley and the cinematography was directed by John Alton. Now, John Alton, he was a very, very sought after cinematographer in Hollywood during the noir era. I mean, he, it, he was one of those that helped to give noir its cliche classic look, you, you know, with you know, the very high contrast lighting, you know, the very darkly shot scenes. And uh, yeah, if, if you were looking to make a noir in this era, he was your go-to guy. Everyone wanted John Alton. But he didn't do just noirs. Um, in fact, his one Academy Award that he won, he won the Academy Award for Best Cinematography for 1951's An American in Paris. And that movie, it was something of a musical comedy. So while noir was his forte, he did do other work as well. So let's get back to He Walked By Night. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention for a moment, please? You've all been asked to sit in on a little experiment tonight. We're going to try to build a picture of a face. A face of a man who's cunning, resourceful, and deadly. He's a man who killed a police officer. Now, some of you he held up at the point of a gun. You may have seen his face, remembered something about it. And we want you to tell us exactly what you remember whether it's his hair, eyes, nose, or mouth. And we're going to try to put those pieces together so that they add up into a picture of the face of the man we want. Now, you can see how we're depending on you. Right? Now, first, we're going to concentrate on the type of hair our man had. And if the picture looks anything like his hair, I want you to speak right up. All right, the first slide, Lee.
His hair had waves in it. Well groomed. That's the idea, Miss Smith. Is that any closer? Mm, no, it, it was parted on the side. Oh, that's more like it, except it was thicker. Oh, that's very close. Yes, that's the way his forehead looked. It was broad, high. All right, hold that slide. Now, the next series of slides will take into account his eyes. Oh, one minute, please. Wait, one minute. His eyes were a little like that. Maybe a little smaller, like beads. Go on, Lee. Now, now you've got it. Now hold that slide, Lee. Anyone else? That looks like him, only a little madder. He had a patch over one eye when he came into my dive, uh, my place of business. I remember noticing that the one showing was blue. Well, the guy that stuck me up had on horn rim glasses. He was wearing a Band-Aid across his nose when he knocked me over. Uh-huh. All right, hold that, Lee. Well, so much for the eyes. Go ahead. Senor Capitan. Yes, Miss Montavo? Ay, ¿cómo se dice en inglés? Uh... A sus órdenes, señorita. Ah, qué bien. En este bandido, la nariz fue chata, como aquella, pero un poco más chata y más ancha. Like that, Captain, but uh, more snub, wider. Try another one, Lee. Como aquella, casi la misma. She says that's about it. Thank you very much, Miss Montavo. Get Reeves. Uh, any more comments? That's pretty close, all right. Pretty close. Perfect. All right. Now we'll start on the mouth and chin. The next series, Lee. I think his lower lip stuck out more. The mouth was thin and mean, like it never laughed. Go ahead. Something like that, but thicker lips. There. That's it. That's him. All right, now hold that right there, Lee. Oh, come in, Mr. Reeves. Good evening, Captain. Did you ever see that face before? Why, it's Roy. Except for the hair being a little lighter and the eyebrows heavier. It's Roy. You're sure? I'm positive I'd know him anywhere. Lee, I want a retouched photograph. Now lighten the hair and give more body to the eyebrows. Right. Lights. That's all. Thank you very much. You've been a great help. It's positively amazing how you found out what he looks like. Well, we're looking for an amazing criminal, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you and good night. Good night, Captain. And so the face of the unknown killer, built up from fragments of evidence, was sent out all over the country to chiefs of police, to sheriffs, to county constables and county jailers, to the wardens of prisons, to all postmasters and postal inspectors, to the agents of the Treasury Department, to the FBI. They showed that picture to the inmates of jails and prisons, to men with a wide acquaintance among the cat burglars and the violence boys. Informers and con men and sharpshooters were quizzed those on the fringe of crime and those deep in the rackets. Many wanted to help. Nobody could. No one in the underworld recognized that mysterious face. He was as unknown as if he had lived in the 16th century.
Control yourself. I know you're alone in the house. Act like you're alone. Cops are watching every move you make. The police here? They got you staked out like a muskrat hide, watching you around the clock. Here at your plant, tailing your car. Sit in that chair. Pick up three books. Don't look up and don't answer me. All right. So glance at the books. Pick one of them. Okay. Now that's the book you want to read before you go to bed. Now, get up and turn off the lamp. Come here. Come here. Go in the den. Pull those drapes tight. know about me? Not very much, Roy. No fingerprints. They haven't even got a picture of you. They're trying to make one. <laughs> How much cash you got in the house? None. I never keep any cash in the house. It isn't good business. I suppose you think it was good business letting me walk into that trap. No, I know. Don't do anything you'll regret. Now listen to me. It isn't too late. Give yourself up. Come to your senses before you kill someone else. What do you mean, someone else? What do you mean? Nothing. I, the two officers, they said one of them might die. But he's still alive, isn't he? Reeves? I never thought you'd stooge for the police. You almost got me killed. Troy, you know the police are right outside. You'd never get away with it. That's right. Now you're being sensible. I know this money here. Where is it? Don't worry. I'll get it.
that's not enough. Stuff you've got of mine is worth thousands. I'll get more. Get it. Keep it handy. I'll be back next week and next month. But get it and have it ready. Just give me time. Oh! Look, I don't want policemen outside my house following me around. That's what made Roy suspicious. I'm leaving in the morning. I'm afraid I'll have to disappoint you, Paul. Unfortunately, you're our bait. I won't do it. I've done enough. Look, no one's done enough until we find this killer. I asked you to keep a sharp lookout on this house, Marty. I did. Two of the best undercover men of the department were assigned here. That didn't keep Martin from getting in. What's the matter? You tired? You got any idea how long you've been on this case, Marty? Months. Long enough to have come up with something by this time. You know any more about the Rawlins killer than you knew the first week? Yeah. But he's about the toughest nut I've ever had to crack. That's what I told the chief when he called me in this afternoon and wanted to know why the case hadn't been broken. Look, Captain. Rawlins was a friend of mine. So is Chuck. I've got a bigger stake in this than the chief knows. I'm doing everything I can. Oh, I'm afraid it's not enough, Marty. Maybe you're too close to it to see it clearly. Maybe it needs a fresh team, a new viewpoint. I think you better take a couple of weeks off, Marty. Starting tomorrow. Anything you say, Captain. Hiya, Marty. Hi, Chuck. Meet Miss Scanlon, my new bodyguard. He's the one I've been telling you about. Oh, you mean the one with the steel trap brain? How do you do? Hello. Say, this guy been behaving? After a fashion. See, she takes me out in my go-kart, puts me to bed, wakes me up, dresses me. You're perfectly capable of dressing yourself now, Mr. Jones. I'll be back in a few minutes. Well, how's it been going, Junior? Oh, pretty good, Chuck, pretty good. Is that why you're off the case? How'd you know? Breen was in to see me this morning. Oh. Suppose he also told you they put a new team on the case. He told me everything. Yeah. Let's see what his new boys dig up. Well, maybe they'll examine the facts of the case a little more carefully. What facts? That our man's sharp, that he's intelligent and works alone, that he has no record, never leaves a fingerprint and knows every move we make? Sure, plenty of facts, only they add up to nothing. Sure, forget it. You got yourself a ten-day vacation. Go on down to the beach, get a suntan. By the time you get back, the case will be broken. Isn't that what you want? You know better than that. All I know is what I hear. You sit there batting your gums about how the old man let you down. Maybe he's trying to wake you up. He's got a funny way of showing it. There you go, flying off the handle. Always taking things for granted. I wish I could get up and boot some sense into you. He knew what this case meant to me. He still does. That's why he's trying to get you mad enough to do something about it. You don't really figure that's his idea, do you? I know it is. Ah, it's a tough case, Chuck. Not an angle, nothing to go on. You'd know what I meant if you were out working with me. I have been working with you. That's all I've had to do lately, just sit around studying what little facts we have, trying to figure out who he might be. You know the kind of a guy we're up against, then. I tell you, Chuck, this guy's a genius the way he operates. As if he were right there with us every time you go out after a lead. Oh, sure. Breen's been tipping him off just to make you look bad. Yeah, almost like that. Well, he beats us to the punch every time. There's your angle. You just hit it on the head, but you don't see it. Look, start at him. One, he's unknown to the underworld. Two, he beats you to the punch, right? And three, it's almost as if he were with you. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. Well, tie that up with a lot of other little things, like the fact that he uses a police gun and the accuracy of the shooting. Anybody could buy a police gun, and they... Army could have taught him how to shoot. Yeah, but who taught him how the police operate? Oh, 
I know what you're driving at, Chuck. But, but a cop, those things happen. Yeah. Now, if I were still in the case, I'd start with our own department first, then Santa Monica, Culver City, Burbank, Pasadena. See you later, Junior. Hey! Don't let him out of your sight, beautiful. It's the first time in years he's used his head. <laughs> Did you get a print of every mug we take? We always send L.A. a copy, Sergeant. It's personnel photos I want. You mean of our boys? That's Rollins' killer, isn't it? That's right. You've checked your own department. We did that first. And so the tedious quest went on. Sergeant Brennan wore out his shoes and his patience, going from police station to police station checking photos until his eyes were blurry. For police work is not all glamour and excitement and glory. There are days and days of routine, of tedious probing, of tireless searching, fruitless days, days when nothing goes right, when it seems as if no one could ever think his way through the maze of baffling trails of criminal leaves. But the answer to that is persistence and the hope that sooner or later something will turn up some tiny lead that can grow into a warm trail and point to the cracking of a tough case. Well, that does it, boys. Can't say I'm sorry you didn't find him in here. I'd hate to think it was a cop. Doesn't seem to be anybody. Just a lot of pieces of a face that never existed. Do you mind if I see that again? Sure, frame it. Put it on your dresser. Wait a minute. He wasn't a cop. He was a radio technician right here in our dispatch office. What did you say? I'm saying he worked here in 42. Well, come on, give. I remember the kid well. He was sort of strange, never bothered with anyone in the department, just kept to himself. But he was in line for promotion when he was drafted. Where was he living at the time? I don't remember. Try the dead files. He never asked for his job back after the war. I remember writing to him about it, though. He was an excellent worker. Oh, yeah, here we are. Yeah, this is it. it took a while before he answered, but like he says in the letter, he wasn't interested. Postmarked Hollywood. No return address. What do you want us to do? All the work? Oh, thanks a lot, Freddy. You remember, he was a civilian employee. Well, how about it? Anybody recognize him? Not on my route. I never saw him before. Uh, okay, fellas, thanks very much. Hmm. I thought for a minute... No. He had that face. I wonder. Yeah? Well, this may not mean anything, but he looks like a guy that's on my route. He never gets any mail, but I see him around here all the time. He lives in one of the courts. Where? Come on, I'll show you. It's not that easy. What time does your route take you past those courts? About nine o'clock. Why? Just think. You got any chocolate milk? Sure have, buddy. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks. Which apartment? Straight on back. Second in the yell. Number seven. Right. Had a warm today, huh? Oh, it's not too bad for this time of the year. Good morning. Morning. You're immune allowed, aren't you? Yes, yeah, substitute. What happened to the other fellow? Sick. Oh, what's the matter with him? I don't know. I catch everything. Hear about it in the radio, and next morning I got it. 
Too bad. You aren't very social. The regular fellow always stops and talks to you. Sorry, lady, I'm a little late this morning. I was hoping maybe you could help me. There's something very funny going on in this court. Yeah? I was scared to go to the police with it. I thought maybe I might be poisoned. What? Yeah. By the manager. She's a witch. She's a what? A witch. She puts poison in my milk. Oh, I see. Look. You switch the bottles while she isn't looking, you see. Drink her milk. Then you'll be safe, right? A little accident. You've got a mop, I'll clean it up. Leave it be, I'll clean it up myself. Okay, mister. The place is called Bellevue Court. I drew this to memory, but it's pretty close. That's where he's hiding out, right there. You sure he's our man, Marty? Captain, I couldn't go wrong on that face. He's our man. Now, there are five cottages in this area, and two, number six and seven, in the L at the end of the row. Our man lives in number seven. This building department plan will show you the whole layout. Bounded on three sides by Fuller, Santa Monica, and Poinsettia. Now, the court is partly surrounded by a high wall. Breen, homicide. Good, you keep your eyes open until we get there. Morgan has just gone into his bungalow alone. Any questions? All right, you all have your instructions. Let's go. Out on time. Wait five minutes. Go around and block the side entrance. Keep your lights off.
units in the vicinity of Santa Monica and Fuller. The murder suspect in the Rollins killing is at large. covering the storm drain system in this area. Get it? Meet me at Bennis and Garfield. Jones, Miller, you stay here in case he comes up for air. I want a man at every other drain entrance along this line. You've got to come up somewhere. Come on, Marty. You're driving. Drain covered. It's liable to pop out anywhere. Why Venice and Garfield, Captain? It's the main intersection of the system. We can head him off that way. ADK to Control 1. Clear Frequency 7. This is an emergency. Control 1 to all cars on Frequency 7. Stand by. Control 1 to ADK. Go ahead. Notify homicide. Send the following to Venice and Garfield. Four squads, battle lanterns, gas mask, tear gas. Urgent. This is a code 3. Control 1 to ADK. Roger.
probably head down this main drain to where it comes out at the Rio Hondo. Now, you take your squad and cover that exit. Right. Keep all spare radio cars cruising back and forth along this main street. Watch the curb inlet. We'll go in here. Any kind of them? No. And we've searched every foot between here and the Rio Hondo outlet. And he must be up ahead.
welcome back. Now, I'll tell you, how did you like that? The scene where they were putting together the composite using a slide projector? <laughs> I'll tell you, that is long removed from how they would do it today with computers. And then, uh, I'll tell you though, it had the ending. I mean, the best kind of ending that you can have for a crime drama. You know, the climactic gun battle between the crooks and the cops. <laughs> it, was, it was almost like the ending to White Heat. You know, if you ever saw that movie with James Cagney, another one, classic gun battle at the end. Just the way I like them. <laughs> Now, I have to say that in tonight's picture, we did have an outstanding performance by the dog. I mean, just the way he was always loyal to his master. You know, he would whimper at the window whenever he noticed something going on outside. And yet his role was completely uncredited. He appears, the dog appears nowhere in the credits. A travesty if there ever was one. Now, Jack Webb, you know, who he had a small role in tonight's picture. He played the role of Lee Whitey. He was the forensics expert back at the crime lab. Jack Roll, or, or excuse me, Jack Webb, if he looked familiar, he should. Jack Webb was the producer and lead actor for the 1950s and 60s crime drama TV series, Dragnet. Uh, he was the producer of the series and starred in its lead role as Detective Joe Friday. Now, the interesting story is, of course he's appearing in this picture here, but tonight's picture is also where he got the idea to create Dragnet. While they were filming the movie, he became friends with one of the technical directors. Uh, it was Detective Sergeant Marty Wynn. He was a technical director for tonight's picture. He basically would advise them on what police procedures would be so that the movie could appear more authentic. They became good friends and just in various conversations uh, that he had with Marty Wynn, Jack Webb got the idea to create the radio and TV series Dragnet. Uh, so becoming friends with Marty Wynn in tonight's picture, this is where Dragnet came about, <laughs> its origins. And, uh, I just thought that was worth mentioning here. Uh, now, if you like tonight's picture, you want to see more like it, remember to click on the subscribe button down here. You'll be notified of all future releases up here in the notification bell. And you can always just type Full Moon Matinee in the search bar up here, and you can find all of the prior releases. And, as always, I thank you for spending the evening with Full Moon Matinee. Stay with us as we continue our further investigations into the long lost evidence of Hollywood. Until next time.